Our second basic skill in propositional logic is the construction of proofs. Our first basic skill was learning how to take English sentences and turn them into strings of symbols. Things like you see right here. Now we want to be able to take these symbols and show that they correspond to valid arguments. So here's a string of symbols. The claim is that these this string of symbols represents the structure of a valid argument. We are going to construct a proof over here that shows and proves that this is a valid argument. All right. Now remember in theory we would like to say that all these symbols correspond to some actual English argument. I spent a few minutes trying to think of a good argument uh, that would correspond to these F's, G's, and H's. I guess I wasn't feeling very creative because I didn't come up with anything. You might take it as an entertaining uh, side project here. See if you can think of an argument in English that would have this structure and would actually use F's, G's, and H's. Um, but so. Um, when we're looking at a string of symbols like this and setting up an argument, remember the first thing is just to identify the premises. There's one premise, two premises, three premises, and then we have the conclusion. That's why we have one, two, three, listing of the premises, and then I put the conclusion down at the bottom. This symbol right here, you'll recall, is the logician's therefore. What's its technical name? It's called the turnstile. Alternatively, it's also called the entailment symbol, but the turnstile or the entailment symbol, it basically just says, here comes the conclusion. Okay. Now, to set up our proof, as I've said, we list the premises one on top of the other and we number them. We put the conclusion at the bottom. Our goal is to show that we can get from the premises to the conclusion using the rules that we have. Of course, there's another column that I need over here, and that's called the justification column. Because every line that shows up in our proof has to have a reason for its existence. So we put the justifications over here. What's the justification for every premise? Well, basically, we're just assuming that it's true, so we're going to call them assumptions. And we know we don't want to have to rewrite assumption over and over again, so we're going to abbreviate assumption with a capital A. Okay, So we have three premises, and every one of them is an assumption. Now, if we're going to get from the premises to the conclusion, we're going to have to have a rule that lets us make some progress. In fact, ultimately, we're going to have about 24 rules. But right now, this is the only rule that's available to us. It's the rule called arrow out. I like to depict the rules as little diagrams. To me, this captures all the important information. This line right here, the solid line, I call the therefore bar. And all the rules that we're going to look at say, if you have what's above the therefore bar, then you get to write what's down below it. If you have what's above it, you get to write what's below it. And the P's and the Q's here are basically just placeholders for whatever comes before and after the important connectives. Now, to me, the picture makes sense. But I know that some people actually prefer to think in terms of English. And there are some textbooks which present the rule this way. You know, so this sentence says, if you have a conditional P or Q on a line of your proof, well, that's what P or Q here is obviously standing for, and you have its antecedent P on another line, ah, yeah, see, I have P on another line, then you can write its consequent Q on a third line. Now, I think if all you had was this sentence, you know, that, that would be disastrous. I really want to visualize what's going on. But the truth is, I think if you're really going to understand this well, you do want to have kind of a story that you tell about what it means. And here's the story that I like. It's really just a variation on what's written right here, but I think that this is, is more helpful.
when you see P arrow Q, every time that you're doing a proof and you see the arrow as the main connective, I encourage you to say this sentence to yourself. If I can find P on another line by itself, then I can write Q. If I can find P on another line by itself, then I can write Q. And then as you continue and you look for P, you say, oh, I found P. And then, of course, you get to write Q. I'm writing Q. So let me explain how this works with respect to this one particular example here. Now, every, when I jump in and look at a proof, the first thing I do is identify the main connective of the line I'm looking at. Obviously, the main connective for this first line is that arrow right there. Wake up, pencil. You've got work to do. OK, here we go. Um, so there's the main connective for the formula right there. If you know the main connective, then you know what counts as P and Q. P is everything in front of it. Q is everything after it. P and Q are just placeholders for what comes before and what comes after. So when I'm looking at P over Q, so when I'm looking at this sentence over here, what I'm supposed to, to do is to say to myself, if I can find F arrow G on another line by itself, then I can write G arrow H. And so I take a look and I say, oh look, I found F arrow G. I found the P part. I found F arrow G. Therefore, I am now writing G arrow H. This is the story you should tell every time you're, you're thinking about a conditional. Now to finish it off, all I have to do is put in a justification, the reason for why I got to write G arrow H. And of course, the two lines that I was just thinking about were 1 and 2. And so I'm going to write 1, 2, and then the name of the rule that I just used, which is arrow out. Another way to indicate what's going on here is that I just used line 1, and it was P arrow Q. And then I also, on line 2, I made use of line 2. It was the P part of line 1. So there's my P arrow Q and P that allowed me to write Q. I know that for some people I'm way over explaining this, but for these early examples, I want to be as wordy and as wordy as possible. I, I hope that this is a useful thing to do. All right. At this point, I worked on line one. I could put a little check by it. It was the the conditional P R O Q that I started with was line one. I worked on it so I could put a check by it. Now I'm going to continue on the way down. You might say, wait, you also worked with line two, right? Well, notice that I, when I used line two, I was thinking of it as the P part of line one. But when I look at line two on its own, I am reminded that I should think about this story for this particular line. And so when I look at this, I think to myself, if I can find F, on another line by itself, then I can write G. Oh look, I found F. So on line 5, I am writing G. And of course the line, two lines that I just used are 2 and 3. And so I'm going to write 2, 3, and the name of the rule, arrow out. What line would I check off at this point? Well, I could check off line 2. The checking off isn't essential, but I think it can very much help you um, to keep track of what you've done if you can be very disciplined about checking things off as you work. Well, notice I haven't gotten, gotten to H yet, so I know I'm not done. But if I'm just working my way down here, I say, well, I worked on line 1, I worked on line 2. When I get to 3, I say, this doesn't even have a connective. It's too short to be interesting. I'm not going to bother to stop and think about it. 
Instead, I'm going to move to line 4. And I look at line 4. I say, oh, it's another arrow. I know the story I'm supposed to tell. And so I look at this and I say to myself, if I can find G on another line by itself, then I can write H. I found G, therefore on line 6, I get to write H. And what will the justification for that be? Well, of course, it's 4 and 5. So that's 4, 5, arrow out. Now, if you're saying to me, wait a second, H, that's what we were after, right? In fact, you're exactly right. I could have alternatively just called this line 6 and said 4, 5, arrow out, um, and said, yeah, well, I've got some empty space here, but that doesn't bother me. Since I got to H, I'm done. I have constructed a proof that shows that this string of symbols represents a valid argument. The reason that this is a proof of that is because I have shown that I can get from the premises to the conclusion by four steps of arrow out. And we have previously agreed that the arrow out pattern is a valid pattern. It preserves truth. All right, um, that's the first proof.